Right. The process of creation is really not mine. It's something that has been passed to me. It's like a baton. I hold it for a little bit and then I pass it on to somebody else. That's why I love it. That's why I study it and have studied and continue to study. My name is Miha Sarani and I'm a visual artist. This commission's for a friend of mine, Sarah. She just has impeccable taste. It's a good challenge, like how do I build this work and trying to keep that in mind. Hi, Miha, Hi, Sarah. how are you? I'm well, Welcome. how are you? Nice so to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Come on wow, in. Wow, what a fantastic space. Thanks for coming. Want me to show you oh, around? My pleasure. I would love to see it. Okay, yeah. great. This commission is for a space that is is magnificent because so much is left for the interpretation. A lot of space, a lot of blank wall space, which can be a little scary because you, you don't know what to put in there. Now this is this will become the anchor of that wall. Okay, so dining room. You know how I am. I just like everything a little bit neutral. Right. Um, I do like a little metallic and obviously my blue and white, but I don't want anything too, I want something abstract, but I want it kind of plain and simple. Okay. Because so we've got this space. Okay. We've also got a couple places in the living room. All right. And I'm kind of toying with the idea, we have a mirror in here, but I was kind of thinking the traditional kind of mirror over the fireplace, but. Oh, I like that. Charlie's not 100% sold, so. Okay. That's a good idea. Let's take a look at it. Elements, for example, in this specific space where this painting will reside is that there's a lot of uh, symmetry and balance, which kind of gives you stability. It makes things very solid. All the early Renaissance paintings are very stable. They're constructed on a grid. They're not meant to evoke emotion so much as rationale. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of really leaning towards the space over the fireplace. I think it really, will tie the room together nicely, which you've done such a phenomenal job. Okay. If you think Turning this is the spot, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about the, the, your, your, your decor, your mm -hmm. design. What, was there, what were you kind of thinking in terms of your, your own space that you reside in? Well, obviously I know it's a craftsman and it's 1924. That's right. the year it was built. So we're trying to give it a little bit of a almost 100 year makeover. So um, I like things traditional because I didn't want to take away from what the house was, right. um, but I just wanted to enhance it. So I kind of felt like I love keeping a few traditional pieces, but then also bringing in a little bit of the modern, you know, kind of like the Lucite table. But I love to keep fresh flowers and orchids and living things also. It just looks fantastic. So I think this might be the new home. Okay, let's do it. All right, I'm excited. Yeah. Exciting. No red, don't forget. No red. No Got red. It. Thank you. I was born in Ljubljana, which is the capital of Slovenia. I came to America for the first time in 2000 and eventually moved permanently to the U.S. in 2007. And I've been here since then. I had dreams and aspirations as a child of being an artist. That didn't really pan out. I tried to go to the uh, middle school that would, for art specifically that would then take me to art academy but I got rejected and that stopped any art making for a couple of decades. I do remember that rejection particularly at that early of an age and I really thought that I, I would be able to communicate 
my desire primarily, but also I thought I was really talented. I was just shocked when I, when I wasn't accepted. It was really a, a crushing blow for a very long time. In hindsight, I'm glad that it happened because it made me return to my vocation, which is now to make art later in life. And that really forced me to work harder because I didn't have time to just kind of lollygag. I was pretty focused on what I wanted to do, which was paint and draw um, and just really own that craft. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful that it happened later on in life because I think it uh, gave me a more desire to really do it quicker, to kind of get to it. One thing I was thinking is how do I take this idea of uh, symmetry, the balance, and you know things that are symmetrical and balanced are usually very, um, they're not very dramatic. Th there's something has to happen within them, so there wouldn't be a lot of diagonal lines or a lot of uh, curvilinear lines, but you know mostly grid-like structure. So I'm trying to think of how can I introduce a counterbalance to her space being symmetrical and balanced to begin with. It really becomes interesting, how do I play with that static imagery, that static form, that grid, and then work within it. The first step that I wanted to take was try to find the type of work that I think she could, would respond to. So, for example, I'm looking at how did he stage it, how did he build up the textures and, and as you can see is there's colors below the surface so you know this requires a lot of work and, and preparation because you need to be able to disrupt that surface like he did. So I'm, I'm using um, works of the past to help me see if there's a way to try to take elements and then synthesize those into work that I would like to make that I would be proud to, to, to uh, give her as a commission. Once I've, I've looked at the, the, kind of looked at the work that I like, I'm, I wrote down a few key sort of uh, points that I want to keep in mind. So for example, no red, keep it abstract. Um, I switched from canvas to panels, but Again, keep in mind that her house is balanced, is symmetrical, it's very clean and, and, and precise and like I said, it's a great space. So with that in mind, based on the images that I have looked at, I'm kind of put down initial uh, thumbnail, which is going to be that I'm looking at uh, a, a rectangle versus a square. Take a dab of uh, acrylic paint, so we'll keep a white just in case we need to really work on that. So, I want to see, let's see, what's going to work well is, uh, oh, I actually have some, is that white? That's white. Okay, so let's just, I'm, I'm trying to imagine that this is the, the surface below, almost like an underpainting. Like if we think in terms of that Cy Twombly that we saw. Most artists are very thrifty individuals because they have to be. You don't want to put a ton of, of materials and commitment and time on that canvas, you know, just to realize, oh, I shouldn't have mixed this kind of blue with that kind of ochre, right? It's just not going to work well. And more or less, I can figure that out in this scale without having to, to go on through that painful lesson in real life. The moment I returned to art was 10 years ago. Art history, in my opinion, when it comes to art making, is, is as essential as the, the, the 
conquering the skill, figuring out how to do what you want to do. Because unless you understand what has been done before, then you can't really think of moving further that needle. You're just going to do things that have already been done by someone else. Um, early on, you look somebody to look to, but then eventually you also need somebody to pass on that knowledge too, otherwise your cycle isn't really completed. Sometimes the technology that we use, the, the materials that we use, they can betray us, right? And in his case, he was using lead white, and now he's managed to bring it in here, and how it kind of has this pendulum kind of effect. Yeah, it's really cool. Also, the, the, the circle used to be much, much larger. Look at that. But how much does that change in terms of the sense, you know? Because it's one thing to kind of know it and reference it every once in a while, but to talk about it for you know two, three hours nonstop and really communicate information succinctly and with some sort of you know exciting launch behind it, that's a whole different thing. Mind purpose, right? So like right here, the adoration of Magi. That's not a painting. That's an underpainting. So in it, you figure out all if it actually works. Like, is it balanced? Is it symmetrical? Generally, this is kind of an antiquated way of painting and everything with kind of postmodern art making, like you may get rid of all this together. You wouldn't need it. And after the first session that I taught that I realized this was the best job I ever had, hands down. The first thing I would usually do is stain the wood, and I, I stain it with coffee. I use this brush. This is my absolutely favorite brush. I don't know what kind of brush it is. I bought it at a cheapo store. The, the thing about coffee is that it will, it will stain the wood, but not as dark as it, it is when I first lay the coffee on it. I even like that, see? I wouldn't have known to add that had the drips not gone there originally on their own. It just adds like a whole, I might keep that. And what's interesting, this is what I say when I talk about chance, is you have to be constantly open that something could happen and then how do you use that to propel the work? I've decided to have a really solid under structure to the work and then put these light layers on top to where it will create a sense of depth as though you're looking through cheesecloth or something like that to where you can see things through but not quite clearly you can't really quite articulate what you see in a distance but there's something there So gesso, it's usually what you use to cover the canvas with. It's, it's a mixture of paint and adhesive. If the canvas is not primed, there's space. And if you were to put layers of paint on top of it, if you didn't prime the surface first, it would just fall straight through. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you, you seal the surface. That's gesso. I think it's really important that one leaves themselves open for ability to respond to the work itself. You can see where the original wood color and then the stained wood next to it, and it just really adds a whole level of complexity that didn't happen before. And after he painted, you know, he realized like, oh, it just doesn't look right. So what I'll do is I'll just paint over. And now it's over this time that it's actually starting to fade. Look at that. Right? Look at the face. I mean, like he's not worried about really just digging into the paint, right? I love the, the, to interact with students. I love to see what they are interested in. I love to get them excited about things. and. It, it, even though it's, it's quite different teaching 
or instructing art making or teaching art history. Those are very different topics to kind of talk about, but it's really both of them are equally gratifying for me. The color combination in these is just fantastic. And even the silver, I didn't even notice that there was a silver the very top, because when she started out, it was all white, and I didn't, it's one of those almost like iridescent, you have to turn your head to realize that there's something happening, which is just beautiful. I'm curious as to what sensation you, you will get in this way. It's, I mean, it's I, really wonderful work. Now this this now it kind of starts to feel like a little bit like on some kefir down here. Not the colors, but sort of the structure. It's like I'm wondering, is that really paint? Is it straw and dirt and grass? So brought it to this point. Um, and now what I will do is I will mark it off. Um, that way I can keep, I don't have to be too worried about pressing into some uncharted territories and worried that I'm gonna. Because I'm not gonna use all the colors, I wanna limit myself to the, the colors that I will use and just pull those out so I don't have to dig for them. up a color that will be light enough to cover some of this but not too much. The reason I'm using this kind of house painting brush right now is because I'm trying to cover loosely a large amount and I'm not, and I'm hoping not to get too caught on the detail itself. Um, and the reason I'm covering this is because I, I'm ch the space in which this painting is intended to live is a light space. I'm gonna use this scrap paper to apply that chance, that chance element. There we go. So at this point, I think that it's ready to introduce color and really start to play those into the work, amplifying the, the texture, create this sense of depth and thin air of, 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 of uh, different hues that are gonna kind of come over the top. So the switch, the jump between non-representational art or, you know, abstraction and portraiture is not that common. For some reason, I've always had this odd split, this duality to where sometimes while I'm working on something representational, a portrait or just the figure, I'm almost kind of dying to do something abstract, but I can't. So that kind of stays with me and I'll sometimes put it in my notebook or like lay, lay down a sketch idea. Then I finish that and I go to abstraction. And it'll often happen that while I'm working on abs that abstraction, I get interested in doing something figurative. And the most common sort of practice is that I, that I go from one to the other almost simultaneously. That's beautiful work. And this one's actually mine. It was interesting to do different versions of it because it started as an observational study with a fountain pen. Um, and then I did a smaller 
a smaller study um, on canvas. Because I had done the two studies before, I knew that this version of it needed to go further. So I just used a palette knife and I just scraped away the face. And of course I was the model for it because I'm cheap. So I try to save money on models. I really like what's happening right here and a little less so what's happening right there. Particularly if that background has some sort of sculptural kind of element to it, it reads much nicer. I might try to come over some of this where these cracks are and really make those kind of come alive. It's an interesting challenge because I'm trying to synthesize all this information and let it be you know, inform the work that I'm doing based also on historically what has already been done by other artists in a similar methodology. So that is all trying to come together and still satisfy my desire to make something interesting that the person will just love. This is the final work. I want it to, to be the kind of work that one takes in over a longer period of time. They look at the work and they can have an immediate response, but then over time they might realize that there are pockets of little information that they haven't noticed before. Once you catch those moments, I think it kind of plays with your perception. Hopefully, you know, she looks at this over a longer period of time and each time catching a more nuanced experience of, of the work. To me, it really becomes about not repeating the same stuff over and over and over, but each little individual contribution becomes its own little magic moment. Here, it really became about the process itself and how does one still keep it all together without it falling apart and yet still staying unique and within my aesthetic language and, and I'm pleased with how it turned out. Good Great to, see, to you. see you. Thanks so much for coming. We're My excited. Pleasure. I'm excited too. Um, so before I show it to you, what I wanted to tell you is that the few things that I remembered that we spoke about originally that I tried to incorporate was the, I loved all the, the, the silver highlights that you have in your room. So I try to bring that in and also I wanted to disrupt some of the symmetry while still keeping the symmetry kind of included. So are you Love ready it. to see it? Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Oh, pleasure. I love how there's like the kind of abstract pieces in the middle, but then I love the silver, the black, the, you know, kind of neutral colors as well. So it's just, I think it's just perfect. Let's see what it looks like in its new home. That looks awesome. Oh, I think it looks perfect. Do you love it? I do. Oh gosh, Charlie's gonna just freak out when he walks in tonight. Great job, Neha, thank you. You could really look at it, and every time you came mm -hmm. around and you look at it like, oh, I never noticed that before. That's kind of... Oh, for, no, you I know love I mean? that like, stuff. Like, just like yeah. a design that Where you just cool see it and you would like, look at it like, yeah, okay, cool, move on. But here it would be something that would constantly sort of unravel each time. And then like, oh, I never noticed this cracks over here. Or, I don't know, something yeah. like that. No, it's really, really cool. We need to do an art lesson with the kids. And I, like I said, it was just not any red was, was painful. It was painful. 
<laughs> Everything I own is red. To have this reaction and this excitement is humbling because you become part of this intimate space uh, and to have them respond favorably and with excitement to, to something you made which came out of nothing is it's incredible. I mean, I still feel profoundly grateful that people are willing to invest uh, time and energy and, and emotion into what I do, right? To spend time looking at something and enjoying it, it's a gift. I, I don't take it for granted and I'm just ecstatic that she's excited about the work. <laughs>